Welcome to the Projection Booth. I'm your host, Mike White. Joining me on this special commentary is Mr. Jonathan Owen. Hello. And Miss Kat Ellinger. Hello. And we are talking about Tomorrow I Will Wake Up and Scald Myself with Tea, which, Jonathan, I think you said you wanted to say that title each time just so that we ate up time as we talk, correct? Yes, please. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Some of the translations of that title are amazing, though, because there's I'll get up and scold myself with tea, or I'll, I'll bake myself with tea was one translation I saw of it. You get some really interesting little riffs on it. It's interesting it has this English title because apart from like a BBC2 showing here in the early 80s i don't know whether this ever had any sort of home video release here yes as far as i can see it never got either a theatrical or uh, any yeah home video release uh, as far as i know i think the sole release was or, or the sole uh showing was that kind of now mythical uh, 1982 uh, BBC Two screening. And I think, in fact, in relation to the name, I think that was one of the problems for people who were trying to find quite a strange scheduling decision, I think, but a good one. And this was directed by Yindrik Polak, who actually a lot of people knew of his one of his earliest films, uh, known as Ikri XB1, but it was retitled Voyage to the End of the Universe, and I've seen that play on, you know, your UHF channels um, late at night or early in the morning because it's kind of this, it's a, it's an innocuous but kind of a fun sci-fi film, and then I know that a lot of people will take uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey and kind of tie some things back to it because it was doing some really interesting special effects. Yes, I think the yes, there is a story. I think isn't it that Kubrick did see it and uh, apparently admired it and sort of saw it as being kind of at a higher level than a lot of the other sci-fi films that he was watching. Um, and I rewatched it recently, and I mean, I think it's an interesting comparison with this film. It is probably the only film that Polak is known for internationally which I think probably is fair to some extent because I think it does have a certain stylishness and a certain sort of modernist element that I think his other films don't tend to have. Um, but I think it does make an interesting comparison with this one because I would say Ikaria XB1 is a bit more the kind of traditional sci-fi film that I think you would see from Eastern Bloc countries because it's about uh, space exploration. I think there were not as many films made about time travel. I think time travel was perhaps less acceptable, I think less welcome as a, a theme because I guess it is more purely fantastical than the idea of space exploration. So I think tomorrow I will wake up and sculpt myself with tea is a little bit more unusual, I think, as a, as a, a sci-fi theme. This comes from a, uh, it seems like a, a few stories, though it's usually credited to one story, Expedition in the Wrong Direction, uh, by Yosef Nezvadba. Though I think also we should credit a lot of Milos Matsarek, because he always had such a flavor of the unusual when it came to his screenplays, and I have always enjoyed pretty much everything that I've ever seen from him. And it's one of those where the more I see, the more I like him. And he's just kind of this unsung hero for me because he would come up with some of the most amazing concepts and just some of the strangest films. Um, I know for sure that uh, Kat, you're familiar with I justice, which he had done. And then also I think he was the screenwriter of Aldrich Lipsky's happy end. Which we're also big fans of. I mean, I justice. I, I was going to bring that up when we get to the Hitler thing because that's another, almost like an alternative history with Hitler. But outside of sci-fi, this really is a like a typical slapstick fantasy. Czech comedy 
which I love, because they are fantasy films. And it just takes this idea of time travel, but it's it's more just for its use as a slapstick device, really. And having this crazy energy, it's very, I'd say, typical in that way, where you just get these insane concepts. Like Happy End is a perfect example, although it's much earlier, not really from this post-70s work, where you see a lot more of the silliness, post-70s. But this idea of taking a story and playing it out in reverse so the film plays backwards and the narrative goes forward which is difficult to explain unless you've seen the film but it and, and lots of gallows humor which this also has especially with the the comic aspect it starts off with someone choking to death <laughs> That's really right about the role of Max Varek. I think, you know, one could make the case that he is probably the defining sensibility, I think, behind this film, because after all, I mean, Polak didn't really direct uh, any other film quite like this, really. Uh, he didn't really make any other fully fledged crazy comedy in comparison with people like Lipsky or Borlicek. So I think, really, I would say Max Varek's sensibility is pretty key. I found uh, an obituary that was written for, for Max Varek by Josef Nesvadba, and it's interesting because Nesvadba talks a little about the differences between the two of them, and um, it seems that uh, Nesvadba wrote the original treatment, which was indeed based on the expedition in the opposite direction story. But apparently he was unhappy at some of the things that Max Varek was doing with the story. So I think, for instance, the use of the tripled characters, the tripled versions of the main character, uh, was something that uh, Nesvadba objected to until he saw the finished film. And then he realised that Max Varek had been right to introduce that. And um, I think... For Matsarek's part, from what I've read about his own statements on the film, he basically felt that he had quite a different sensibility from Nesvadba and that he was less interested in the sort of philosophical or psychological dimensions that Nesvadba has. And he wanted to make something that was principally like an entertainment film. And the quote that I found by him was that really what interested him was playing a game with logic and he said that he was interested in finding the logic within an absurd logic so I think uh, as Kat said it's that absurdity and that kind of play with this weird internal logic that I think is key here it was interesting going back and watching it again because I, I think I'd forgotten how much of a classic farce this is really I think that it's easy to get fixated on the sort of the Hitler stuff isn't it and on the time travel but I mean so much of it is really classic farce and I mean very very good farce as well I think it hits every every beat we talked about how Nesvadba was more concerned about the the psychological aspects of it. And that totally makes sense. I mean, he was a psychiatrist and a doctor in real life. And so many of his stories, we were talking a little bit before we started recording, so many of his stories start with a psychiatrist talking about different patients. And it's almost like a journal of here are these interesting patients that I came across and then they have a sci-fi twist to them. Yes, yeah, very Lovecraftian in that way. Not that the directions that they went in were the same there seems to be less mythology in Nesvabba's work but this emphasis on the existential but there a lot of them are almost like medical reports they're written in that same way that Lovecraft used to write like a scientist writing up their findings and so they have this weird sense of detachment like this overall feeling it's very philosophical what you're reading whereas this if you didn't know that Polak directed this you would think this was a Lipsky film has that same energy to it and the, and the silliness and like Jonathan said the farce which I 
absolutely love. And you don't get more farcical than choking to death on a bread roll like we see here, which I find absolutely hilarious. And this is just so typically Czech, I think. There's that very dark sense of humour, which I enjoy a lot. Yes, and I think the way that he chokes on the roll or the moment at which he cho chokes on the roll is almost a kind of just desserts, isn't it? Because it's at that moment when he's talking and scoffing at the idea of marrying Eva. So I think in a way he gets his comeuppance really in this kind of fateful way. Yeah, he's such a bastard, such a Lothario, and his brother knows a little bit of that, but he'll definitely get to know a lot more when he assumes his own brother's identity. I love this invention of the dissolving soap here, where anything that it touches, except for, well, uh, hopefully it didn't get on his hands, because we're going to see how it acts on biological matter later on. Because this is actually set or supposedly set in the late 90s, isn't it? Yeah, I think 1995. Yeah, it's still very much 1977, just with these odd little, <laughs> little, little, uh, they've got the one that turns people green as well. His weird chemicals and the time travel, but everything else is very, very 70s. I love the audacity of that, that Polak just hasn't even bothered to try and make it this futuristic, you know, it's just very, everything else about it is very, I don't know if mundane is the right word about it, but it's set in this present time, this normal time, which is really interesting. Yes, I totally agree with that. I think that's very much part of the sensibility of Matsurek too, isn't it? I think it's that combination of the outlandish and then the kind of the banal. And it reminds me of a line much later in the film where uh, Vladimir Menshik's character, Kraus, is saying that uh, he has to kill his double because they can't live together on the same, just on one salary. So it's that combination of the kind of everyday concern and this just totally bizarre sci-fi conceit. That's one of the things that, to me, is very distinctive, I think, about a lot of Czech comedy and Czech sci-fi, that there is this kind of under underlying sort of level of just ordinary reality, of the realities of Czech life. And um, it's comparable, I think, to another sci-fi work by Polak, which he did a bit later, called The Visitors, and that was a TV series. It makes an interesting comparison point, I think, with this film in many ways. I mean, because that's also about an expedition from the future back into the past. Uh, in this case, this is set 500 years into the future. But it's about this team of scientists going back in time to retrieve a scientific formula to avert a future uh, catastrophe. Uh, but again, a lot of the time is given just to the uh, daily life of uh, the sort of modern day Czech life, modern day Czech society, which is the past in the film, but which is uh, the present of 1984. So I think, again, it's that interest in the quotidian, which I think is very much part of this uh, aesthetic in these films. This film was very much a sister film to another one called I Killed Einstein Gentleman, which was directed by Older Chlipsky and had the same based on a Nezvadba story and written by Masarek. I love that film. Again, like you were saying, another expedition to the past. But with this one, we have to go back and kill Einstein because of uh, his whole discovery put us on a path where our women have beards in the future and yes. we just can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that one is wonderful as well. And it is very much the same as this in terms of its farce, although it's mainly period set. And you do have a more futuristic angle in that when they're in the present time, which is the future. So it's stylistically, it's slightly different, but it's that same energy, that same pace, people trying to double cross one another and creeping around and... 
I seem to recall there's a scene in that where people are trying to, they're at a, a salon meeting and everyone's getting very confused. And it's very much the same as, as this. And again, in that, you have this idea of killing someone. So it's this very dark sense of comedy. And Happy End is a comedy about a guy who murders his wife and ends up on the guillotine, but it runs in reverse. So starts with that and runs backwards so i mean i find this stuff fascinating it is very quote-unquote eastern european and i think the british share that same sensibility in very dark comedy but i think even in our case we don't tend to get as dark as, as some of the czech stuff but we have things like the league of gentlemen and Yeah, you know, stuff like that, which is very dark. But I'm not sure how this would roll with stateside audiences who, I mean, if you look at typical American comedy, it tends to be much more upbeat, nicer, kinder, maybe. <laughs> Well, as an American, I thought for sure that they were going to go back in time and kill Hitler, not go back in time and help him out. Though I guess in present times, that would probably make a lot more sense. Yes, it's interesting how Hitler is just sort of left hanging, as it were, as a plot element, because we see him react to that documentary footage that's shown about the outcome of the war. And uh, watching it again, I was thinking that we don't really see what happens from that point on, because surely this is a kind of intervention into the past. But I guess by making the second voyage, Jan Beresh has changed that outcome. So, yes, I'm not sure where we're meant to be with Hitler the last time we see him, whether we're meant to assume that something has changed in the outcome of the war or whether it's just meant to play out in the same way again. I assume it does, really. I assume nothing has really been touched in that, in that uh, time frame. And this, to your point from earlier, Kat, is some of the most sci-fi moments that we get this uh, airport that's just been redressed to have these crazy characters walking around because they're all headed out on flights quote unquote to the past kind of reminds me of uh, a sound of thunder with this whole idea of doing expeditions to the past well this was actually filmed so they used the ip pavlova metro station for the departure hall and they also used the continental hotel in prague for some of the interiors and exteriors so they didn't even when you look at something like i killed einstein it's it's very artificial looking but with here they're on location they haven't even tried to find something that looks sort of retro futuristic or you know uh, and all you have to indicate that we are in the future is the fact that you have these people who go on time travels, which I think is a marvellous conceit. Yes, I think there's something about the almost casualness of the way certain sci-fi elements are introduced. So, for instance, like that bio-washing-up liquid or like the anti-aging pills. And uh, to me, it reminds me more of a film like Who Wants to Kill Jesse in that, you know, you have this kind of basic reality that in certain ways is slightly strange or slightly futuristic but these things are not really introduced in a very dramatic way they're almost just part of the fabric of everyday life and uh, yeah i also like the kind of dry humor uh, that underpins that i mean it's interesting in relation to i killed einstein gentleman because as you were saying i think that has these more outlandish sort of sci-fi sets and things and i believe that internally i think i killed einstein gentleman was criticized for being too pure a sci-fi film that it was too much like pure sci-fi and i think for some reason there was a preference within barandoff or within the film industry to sort of leaven the sci-fi elements with humor i think uh, perhaps because it was a way to Uh, underplay the fantastical elements, which were not always welcome, I think, in this uh, political context. So I wonder if that's maybe so, a reason why I think this film perhaps does underplay the sci-fi or sort of leavens it with more humour in comparison to some of the earlier films. 
I prefer it done this way though because it makes it more the 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 absurdity more absurd to see it almost out of place in what looks like a a present day world. I admire too I think the sort of economy with which the uh special effects are uh are delivered and with which some of the sci-fi elements are are shown. From what I've read I mean I think these films were pretty cheaply made. I mean I think even you know, I think for the time the budgets were were pretty small. Although I guess they were relatively expensive in Czechoslovakia at the time, and I, I still find a lot of the effects quite impressive. And I, I also I, I'm also impressed by the economy with which they're done. I think, uh, for instance, I read that the um, the rocket ship when you see it fully is basically like a matte painting and then I, th- I think when you see the characters kind of getting in or getting out of it basically they just built the sort of bottom level so basically you only really see the bottom level close up and they didn't really build any more so when you see the full thing it's just yeah just a painting and uh, I, I, I like those kinds of uh, cheats really I think it makes it fun to <laughs> read about I think if you grew up in the era of like old school Doctor Who, though, it's very much in that same make the best of what we have. It was real old school. The way they did the doubles in this, they had to. We have Peter Kostka playing the two brothers, and so they'd obviously have a body double, but then they'd have to do the effect where they mask off half of the camera to show him in one half and then to show him in the other half as the other brother which is a really painstaking manual way to do it because if you you film the first part of the scene with half of the frame cut off and then you film the second part with the other half of the frame cut off so if you make a mistake in that second part you then have to go back and do everything again it was something they did actually douglas slocum did on kind hearts and coronets where you have alec guinness in that and he plays seven different characters and there's one scene where all his characters and that took them days so it was like really real sort of painstaking manual work to do stuff you don't see the two brothers together that much but and and they're very economical with that which uh, you know, understandably, if it was so such a manual process. I just wondered, did you hear the story about the use of the body double? Uh, because apparently there was going to be more use of the body double and of that technique. But uh, according to one of the anecdotes, uh, basically the guy who was providing the body double was arrested, <laughs> and. Uh, they had to then just use more of the just the traditional sort of double exposure. And it sounds a bit to me like one of those anecdotal embellishments, but I'd like to think that that was true. Do we know why he was arrested? I think it was for yeah, shady dealings or shady business, I think was the, uh, the charge that I read. <laughs> They've been using that technique of blocking off portions of stuff for so long. I love, uh, there's a a Buster Keaton short where he basically is a band, a one-man band of like seven different Buster Keatons all playing at the same time. It's just amazing to watch. It's a real craft to it, isn't there? You take it for granted when you see the two brothers, but when you think about the actual legwork that went into producing a film like this, like Jonathan said, on a very small budget as well, it's quite remarkable and it's not ostentatious. It doesn't show off with any effects. It presents them in this very sort of, like I said, a mundane way almost. And it's quite admirable. No one's showing off about it. I wanted to mention the actor, though, Peter Kostka. When he first read the script for this, Polak had him in mind when they worked on the script and only wanted him, apparently, and he read the script and hated it. And he didn't think that the double would work. He thought audiences would get 
too confused. And one of the ideas they had was to ha- to have the evil brother, as they called him, have like a hoarse voice, which I'm glad they dropped. But he wasn't convinced. And then on a second reading, they they talked him round. But it's interesting, this idea of the double, because I know Mike and I recently talked about Yorai Hertz's Morgiana. And in that, you have the same actress playing two sisters and that one really confused international audiences the fact that they couldn't figure out it was the same woman they thought it was two different actresses even though it's clearly the same woman a wig can make a big difference cat and with this uh the, you know, the concern was, well, they won't understand that it's two brothers, which is really interesting because you actually see them together. So I'm not sure how that confusion can... It does get very dizzying, but I think that's part of its charm, that you do find yourself getting very confused. Yes, I think it just treads that balance between being confusing enough to be exhilarating and not being too confusing that it totally loses you and i guess there's certain things that it does at various points to distinguish them so for instance later on one of them has a black eye i guess if you pay attention to like the costumes that each is wearing they're always wearing different costumes like one will be in the pilot's uniform the other will be in the kind of normal suit and it just it does just enough i think to avoid like complete confusion but yeah as you say there's something fun about the way it just throws you into this sort of bizarre yes bizarre set of multiple identities Speaking of 2001, these space helmets look very 2001 to me, the way that they're shaped. Apparently, the interior here um, in the script, I believe, was meant to look like the uh, interiors in the, um, I believe it was the Soyuz Apollo um, sort of joint mission, um, which was just sort of the first international space mission. Uh, it was between the US and the Soviet Union, which I think took place in the mid 70s kind of around the time the script was written so i think that was an interesting reference point because it's explicitly mentioned i believe in in the script and i think possibly i think was a way to i think indicate uh the idea that this is a sort of a peaceful future in which the two sides basically are cooperating Uh, i mean it's interesting that you have american tourists here which i mean I guess, in a way, are they are sort of satirically represented, but I guess the fact that they're joining this space mission in Prague maybe is some sign that there is some kind of international cooperation or some kind of openness between these different uh, sides in the uh, in the Cold War. I like that they're not even pretending and having people speak different languages. That is just all Czech. Yes, likewise with the Nazi characters. Yes, there's no, <laughs> there's no, uh, yeah, no attempt at other languages. Yeah, I mean, I, I read an interesting criticism by a Czech commentator about the uh, American tourist because uh, somebody felt that the pa- the character of Patrick um, was too much like an English gentleman and that it was more of a satire of the English than of the American. So. Uh, <laughs> Though I do like that they end up getting their nuclear bomb from Washington, D.C., that they can just go in there and steal a nuclear bomb without too much hassle. We don't even get to see that. That takes place off screen. Yes, and I I think there is probably an implicit sort of political dimension to that. I think the fact that it it has come from Washington and um, earlier on in the film, in fact, at the moment, just before... um, Jan Skulls himself with the T. There's a reference to a World Peace Conference, which has been organised by the socialist states. And then immediately after, you hear the report about the bomb being stolen from Washington. So I think there is, in a sort of a relatively subtle way, there is a, a political dimension to that, I think. And the suggestion is, you know, that the socialist states are the ones that are instrumental in, you know, uh, ensure, ensuring peace. Whereas, I mean, the U.S. are the bomb makers and the warmongers. So um, I think there is that 
element there, although I think it's subtle enough that it doesn't really affect our enjoyment in watching it. And this whole idea of them starting off in, I think it's either Argentina or Brazil, and I know Argentina was infamous for taking Nazis, so we have this whole Nazi underground there, or actually not even an underground, they seem pretty open about their love of Hitler there. Yeah, well, they openly pile Hitler everywhere they go, don't they? They're not very subtle about it. It's interesting that they're all in white suits, aren't they, and bow ties, which, I mean, I think it's very much that stereotypical image, isn't it, of the Nazis in South America and... Right, boys from Brazil. Exactly, yes, that was really in my mind. And I think that was made maybe a couple of years before this. I'm not sure how much there was a sort of a direct reference to that, but I think it certainly plays on that stereotype, doesn't it, of the, uh, yeah, the kind of wealthy former Nazi living in sort of quasi... I guess quasi hiding in South America. I believe the country was Peru, actually, because I think there is a there is a, a sign that says In- Inca Cola, which was a Peruvian cola, and I'm not sure how they got that shot. I, I don't know if they took an expedition to Peru just to get that single opening shot, but it does look. It doesn't really look like Czechoslovakia. It looks pretty authentic to me. I also think it's amazing that in the future they trust people to just time travel willy-nilly. Like, that's not going to go wrong. They just allow tourists to <laughs> to wander around in the past. Yes, I think they have that system, don't they, with the, the where the I guess the doors are sort of guarded and, and uh, they're sort of shut in. But still, there's so much that's, yeah, that's potentially going to go wrong there, isn't there, really? And uh, I, I like the idea, too, that you have these people dressed up as pharaohs or dressed up as cavemen and so on, kind of, you know, ushering people around. And it's really, I think it really ties in, I think, with... Postmodernism, I think the idea of history as just a series of representations and you have people just going back to see these sort of, you know, very stereotypical famous historical events or things like the dinosaurs. And it's, um, yeah, I think really was onto something, I think, about the idea that, you know, history just becomes a series of images. What year was Westworld made? 73. Because, you know, Westworld's very, even though it's uh, sort of set in the future, it's robots, so it's not actual time travel. But there is a similar riff there of this idea of tourism and looking at the past and then the things that can go wrong with that. Yeah, I'm not saying this was influenced by Westworld because obviously it's a totally different concept, but it does share that. Like Jonathan said, with the airport and you have people dressed up in these historical costumes and the past has just become part of tourism. And with Westworld, you get this idea that people can go to these historical worlds and they can interact with these robots that are acting parts from like the Wild West or the Roman world. And so it does share some sort of cosmic spirit with this this historical tourism, for want of a better word. And I can't think of many other films that really do that. And I think what makes this particularly provocative for me, I think, in that sense, is the way it combines that sort of kitsch image of history with that sense of reality, to the, the reality of the of the Nazis and of Hitler, and I think the way that I think the Hitler figure, when we see him, is played. I mean, fairly straight, I think, and fairly realistically, which I think was Polak's intention. You know, he's not too much of a cartoonish Hitler. I think there's something in that contrast between these sort of kitschy images of history and this reality that I think makes it quite uh yeah as i say quite provocative i think quite uh, quite daring the old wrong suitcase yes with the nice sort of farcical music as well i think just to underline that the old switcheroo i think we just saw this what two years ago or more with uh what's new pussycat and just that whole i grabbed the wrong suitcase 
It's a fail-safe, though, isn't it? It always works, because you know when they bring that suitcase out, you know, and present it to Hitler, it's not going to have the bomb in. And it, you know that's what's going to happen, but you still laugh, because it is a good one, if it's set up properly. I, li- I like the way that uh, Abbard, the, the Jerzy Sobat character, when he's in his sort of full Nazi uniform with his overcoat, he immediately starts a- acting like sort of stereotypical Nazi, doesn't he? Kind of barking in this German accent. Yeah, we should probably talk about our three Nazi characters because these three actors are just, my God, I love everything that they've been in. Every time I see them show up and stuff, especially Vladimir Mesnik, I've, I've talked about him so many times before. But yeah, Brodsky and Sovak, those guys. I mean, Sovak, we were talking about uh, I Killed Einstein, gentlemen, and he is so different in that one just because he's got this kind of like nebbish uh, thing going on. He's very nervous in that film. And yeah, he's he's just terrific. And then Brodsky... Yeah, like I said, everything I've ever seen him in, he just always brings such a flavor to it. I mean, we just talked about him recently, Kat, with uh, Transport from Paradise. He's one of the characters in there um, who, I mean, it's just such a, I think we called it a greatest hits of Czech actors. And he's in Close Observed Trains as well, of course, as another Nazi. So, <laughs> yes, and he had a very versatile actor too, I think, was able to be very sympathetic, but also to play these rather, yeah, rather, uh, again, sort of like slightly nebbishy, but evil characters like here. Yeah, I think as for Menshik, I mean, there probably are some Czech comedies that he's not in, but I, I can't think of many. He's my favourite. I just love him. And there he is there, the, the, the facial expressions. I didn't get a chance to comment when they're putting their helmets on and they're about to take off and his eyes are rolling in his head. I just, he is just so sublime. I, Any time he turns up in anything. And Happy End, obviously, is like the main character in that. But even in things like The Cremator, where he has this very small role as a loud, this loud guy that turns up at various intervals, he just steals it. Uh, they had, I think, the Czech film industry at that time in terms of comedy, and they were doing a lot of comedy and a lot of this type of comedy post Prague Spring, you know, when everything went a bit more, you know, light hearted and less subversive they were just blessed with these amazing character actors who were just so good at comedy and they picked three of the best here but Menchik is always my favourite and I love the fact that he kind of stays on for most of the film because he is just he's just wonderful in everything that he does I always get really excited when he turns up in something and he has a sort of personality that I think does uh it sort of moves through the various films that he's in. I think there is a sort of a consistency. And to me, he's very much like the kind of Czech everyman or perhaps the Czech id. In that I think he usually represents the sort of the kind of lower instincts as he does here. He's always sort of like uh, being quite lecherous. And uh, I kind of get the sense too that he's somewhat of a subordinate to the other two characters. Uh, like if you see him in the first scene he's not kind of in the main room is he he's kind of waiting outside and i think he's treated really as a kind of a heavy by the others yeah and he's wearing that loud hawaiian type shirt and they're just like why do we need this guy here and yeah he's he's the muscle and when he's the muscle you know that something's wrong yeah <laughs> should we talk about this hitler because we've touched on this I Justice is another one that does this, which is a much more serious alternative history. Very difficult to see. Uh, hasn't had any sort of English translation. But it poses the question, what if Hitler didn't commit suicide? And what if this band of anarchists or whatever they are, this agency, have him in this bunker so that they can torture him and keep showing him his own impending death. It's, just, it's hard to explain, but they keep setting up this scenario where he thinks he's going to die. He doesn't realise these people are against him. And then they have a doctor put him back together again, and then they put him through it. Now, the Hitler character in that is a weirdly sympathetic 
Hitler. He lives in this bunker. He slaps around in his dressing gown. This isn't a comedy. It's a straight up existential drama. But he spends most of his time in this bunker watching his old glories on film. He's not a dangerous character. He's weirdly sympathetic because you end up kind of feeling sorry for him. You don't relate him to the Hitler that we know from history and the terrible things. He just seems like this very confused old man. And the Hitler that we have in this is he's he's not ridiculous he's not particularly frightening he again seems a, like soft and, and a bit confused his reaction to the footage for example and his defeat and it must come from this the script writer but it's given the Czechoslovak history with Nazi occupation and just you know the fact that a lot of the people involved in making and writing this film and 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 starring in it as well lived under nazi occupation and suffered because of it i find it a fascinating angle to take yes yes that it it does offer a certain yes a certain pathos perhaps in this yes in this sort of bizarre way and that scene is really fascinating, isn't it, when he's watching the footage and the fact that he switches it on again and we're with him for that moment because it doesn't really have much to do with the plot of the film. It really could be removed and you would still get the same story. From what I've read, I believe Polak did want that moment to be serious and I think he was quite invested in this part of the film. I think he felt that he was making a serious comment about fascism and about nazism and uh, from one of the one of the interviews that i found with him he said that he'd never seen a film where hitler had been confronted with the consequences of his politics and he'd never there'd never been that moment where he was able to see the consequences or to see the aftermath of what he'd done so uh, yes i think for the filmmakers too this was quite an important sequence there's also a story that when uh, the trio of um, Nazi characters see Hitler, or when they saw, rather, Frantisek Witzena, who plays Hitler, dressed up for the first time in his Hitler outfit, they actually got pretty scared. And the story is, which I think comes from Jerzy Sobak's memoirs, was that um, Vladimir Menshik was so kind of struck by seeing this figure that he, di- he, he dived under a sofa, which seems a very Menshik thing to do. but. <laughs> That uh, yeah, Vladimir Brodsky was struck dumb apparently, so, and and I think that again could be like an anecdotal embellishment, but I think there is something charged about that. I, I think about the accuracy with which he's portrayed, really, because I believe they did take a lot of care about the uniforms and about the makeup and the insignias and so on, and I think there was quite a, a high level of care over getting all of that right, which again is interesting for you know such a farcical film to be so concerned about the accuracy. Well, the weapons, there hasn't been anything at all written about this in English language, really. And obviously, it does have an English language cult following to some extent. But it's a film that largely hasn't been, when you compare it to some of the the, the Czech New Wave, for example, hasn't really been written about. But there is actually a, a web page on a database about weapons in film where it seems like an English speaker has gone to to painstaking effort to screen grab all the weapons in the film and identify them as these very authentic, and I'm not a weapons expert, so I'm not going to start talking about it, but these just very authentic weapons of the period. And when you think that the, the fact... I know with the with the costume design, everything down to the medals and everything had to be perfect. Quite often, when you see the Nazi parody, not that that's a a, a thing that people 
really tolerate these days. Well, we did have Jojo Rabbit last year, though, and that was mixed responses. But generally, they will do something with the Nazis to make them more comical or less authentic or to remind the audience, you know, wink, wink, these aren't really Nazis. And they seem to have done the opposite in, in this. The absolute opposite. We'll go for absolute authenticity as much as we can. And again, I find that fascinating. A fascinating approach to take in a film like this where you'd expect them to be. And there are silly bits, obviously, with that guy's legs just fell off, which is hilarious. But in amongst that, you get this strange authenticity with the Hitler and who's paid totally straight. That's true, too, even of the opening credits where, I mean, at one level, I mean, this is very silly, isn't it? You have this use of the footage of Hitler and it's reversed and they're playing around with it. And at one level, of course, that's about, you know, making him look ridiculous. And it's kind of in bad taste, I guess, to a certain extent. But at the same time, I would say there is, again, something quite potent, something quite provocative about the way that um, about the ca- about the footage that's selected, and uh, what strikes me is that last moment of the credit sequence where you have the face of the woman, and it's this just fanatical expression of this Hitler supporter. And to me, that moment is quite chilling. And so again, I think there is that tension between, on the one level, there is the silliness and the absurdity, but there is also something darker, something more serious there as well. We've been talking a lot about Hitler, but it's the guys that are playing his his other his subordinates that really get me. They're just you know, very few of them get very many lines, but they just have this authenticity to them, the way that they look, the way that they're dressed, just they it's really pitch perfect. I mean, it's always difficult to do Hitler or Nazi parody as well. And it's something that's been in comedy from very, very early on. Ernst Lubitsch was the first to do it in To Be or Not To Be, which was considered a very transgressive film at the time because that was made in 1942. And also we had The Producers in the early 70s, which is possibly the most fabulous bad taste Nazi comedy ever made. When Jojo Rabbit came out, I think because the cli- the climate's changed now, the culture's changed, that some people felt, you know, we shouldn't be laughing about this. We shouldn't be putting this into a comedy. We shouldn't be seeing this as absurd. But I think uh, for certain people, especially in Europe, it, it, it's a sense of catharsis to do that, that maybe they don't, in America, maybe it's slightly different because the culture was at a remove from the actual war. But, yeah, I think it's an interesting route to take because you're always straddling, you know, how far do I go in terms of taste with such a difficult subject? But I admire the fact that filmmakers have been willing to tackle this. Well, we had such an edict here in the States to not portray Hitler negatively for so many years that it took somebody like a Lubitsch to finally break through that because there were, you know, we were still making deals and selling films and showing films in Germany and, you know, Hollywood didn't want to, uh, you know, turn off that cash spigot for a while. It wasn't until at least 1941 when we finally got involved in the war right around this time here in the film that it was okay to start to take on Hitler and start to make cartoons and hell's a poppin' and things where you're going to make fun of Hitler. This sequence is incredible. It really is. Because you don't see it, the setup, you don't see it coming. You don't know what he's going to show him. Yes, I think there's something about the use of documentary footage and the way that it's like this moment of kind of raw reality that penetrates through the, I guess, the sort of farcical construction of the rest of the film. 
yeah, I think it's actually quite moving. And then you have that soundtrack, which I believe is Poland Negri singing um, Tango Noturno, which I believe is from film of the same name from the early 30s. And um, again, very poignant piece of music, I think. Yeah, it's like suddenly Abart has become the ghost of Christmas future. And that's what I mean about taking this balance in. And obviously not every comedy about uh, Nazis does that in that same way. But I think in, in confronting something so terrible with comedy and, and, and making it ridiculous, it... I don't know, it, it it sort of takes away that power, I guess. In showing Hitler as this pathetic individual who is made to face the consequences of what he's done, you know, it takes away the power of him as this strong leader from the past, this impenetrable, you know, force of evil. And I think you can only really do that with comedy. Yes, and I think that was very much Polak's intention, I think, from the based on the interview that I've read. I think uh, he said that, you know, it was a, he wanted to attack Hitler in the form of laughter, which he said, I think, was one of the most effective weapons. And um, I mean, it's interesting when you think about like the Czech or the Czechoslovak reaction to the film because it doesn't seem like there was a lot that the, the, there was a lot of trouble around it and around representing Hitler. I mean, I think the uh, communist uh, countries had rather different fears, ironically enough, about representing the uh, the war and representing the Holocaust. Um, bizarrely and quite horrifyingly, uh, it seems that say the communist uh, authorities were more concerned about anything that was too sympathetic towards the um, representation of Jews because there was that whole anti-Semitic dimension. So, for instance, when Uri Hertz uh, a few years later was trying to make his um, Holocaust film The Night Overtook Me, which he did in the end successfully complete, I think there was a certain concern about where the, the authorities didn't want him to show too much of the Jewish angle. He wanted, they wanted him to emphasize that there were actually other people who were suffering, like political prisoners. They didn't want him to play up the, the fact that it was Jews who were being killed. And so it seems they had quite different priorities, I think, about how to represent this period. But yeah, I think this depiction of Hitler didn't seem to, or doesn't seem to have caused, didn't seem to cause too many problems, I think, for the, uh, the, the, uh, the communist critics and I have one comment by um, Jan Clement who was very much the voice of you know the official um, official thinking uh, on all things um, on all things cinema and uh, he actually compared this film with Logan's Run and he said that what he admired about this film was that it was a much more optimistic and humanistic film whereas he felt that Logan's Run was much too pessimistic and that it was a reflection of the hopelessness of American society. So it does seem that it, it got quite a favourable official reaction. So here we have yet another double scene going on, but you would never know it. I mean, Whenever there's a double scene in a movie, I'm always looking for the line. Where is the line that's separating? Here's a pretty clear line here, but they're doing it so well that you would never guess that this was trickery. No, it's fantastic. It's flawless. It's absolutely flawless. Uh, a nice little tidbit of information there is that the younger version of, Ab Ab of Abad is being dubbed by uh, Yerji Sovak's own son, uh, <laughs> So that it would sound like a younger, like a younger man. Yeah, but again, yes, I, I, I was aware that the voice is slightly different, but I didn't really see the dubbing. So again, quite a, quite a skillful bit of trickery. It's one thing that I was very surprised that never happens in this movie is the whole idea of the anti-aging pills. I thought for sure there would have been something that came about because of that, maybe. 
they gave those to Hitler. So then we see an old Hitler or the same aged Hitler at the end or something. But yeah, it never comes back. Just that they have these anti-aging pills, I guess, to show that the younger Abard is not that different than the older Abard. Although he just looks mainly the same, though, doesn't he? Which is fantastic. Yeah, just some, <laughs> just a little darker hair. Yes, again, the anti-aging pills, are, they're just one of those elements that are thrown in, really, without much further discussion. And these people turning green as well. I love this effect, because it's just so silly. <laughs> Yes, I don't know why it has to turn them green, because it's basically just like a paralyzing agent, isn't it? But yeah, yeah the green is just like a nice <laughs> little addition as well. <laughs> I was going to mention, actually, the idea of the double, because that seems to come up, not doubles, but the idea of people having dual existences and the meaning of those in some of Nez Vadba's other fi short fiction, um, the one, The Death of an Ape Man. So you have, it starts off again with this, this sort of scientific guy making a report about how he's working for a local zoo and he goes to this, circus and they have a chimpanzee there dressed as a man but he's convinced that it's really a man and it turns out that this whole kind of weird colonial story around it about this guy being found his family were killed out in the jungle and he's been brought up by by chimps and 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 is brought back so it's like the tarzan story really is brought back and and what he finds in mankind he, he he's so disturbed by it so you have a sort of sense of dualism in that you know is he a man is he an ape what world does he belong in and then another story the divided carla which again begins with this psychiatrist making a report on this guy brings his wife in saying his wife suddenly started acting strange she's talking in a man's voice she's saying she has to go off to geneva she seems to have acquired these magical powers that can heal people and she's in contact with some institution or some entity that she has to get back there and the, and the psychiatrist first of all thinks it's split personality so it seems like a bit of a theme for Nesba in the it's like a, a, one of those typical existential science fiction themes you know the duality of man and you know the concept of humanity and and it's it's like one of those deep philosophical themes that seems to go hand in hand with eastern european science fiction but the way that it's used here because the nazis we have the whole story about the nazis obviously but it then from this point onwards when they go back to the present burash goes back to the present it seems to become a story more about him redeeming his brother's character and his brother being the dual aspect of him and then being the good brother and the evil brother and it becomes more of a personal story about that family dynamic and and him do, doing what's right and putting things right in his brother's life which is fascinating I keep saying it's fascinating but it is a fa another fascinating angle because it's almost like the Nazi stuff doesn't even seem that important when once we get back it's more to do with putting things right and and putting things right in his brother's life right and also bringing these Nazis to justice yeah you get that but that's almost like a like a slotted in at the end really it becomes more about either making his brother pay and and bringing him to justice or then as we get the triple 
him living his brother living as his brother which is just absolutely bonkers when you think about it giving up his own life to live like this redeemed existence as his brother with his double which when you start trying to explain that to someone <laughs> it's just like yeah it kind of totally makes sense but on paper it's a uh, totally out there in terms of of where it's going what, what the thinking behind it yes it's interesting because the original story expedition in the wrong direction is quite a gloomy and quite fatalistic story isn't it and uh, as you get to the end of that the main character i think is doing a similar thing in that he's trying to change um this particular day and to by going back in time again or going back to this day trying to rectify everything but gradually comes to realize that he is not going to change and that so therefore he can't really do much to affect destiny he can change things superficially but basically things are going to turn out the same way and then the only real free will that's left to him or the only freedom that's left is basically to get shot and to take a bullet and to basically to save somebody so there's a sort of bittersweet element where there is a certain level of freedom but it's ultimately quite a quite a depressing ending whereas i think this film as you say you have this much more positive outcome where i guess jan is able to live both as himself and as his brother so he's able to kind of uh, live up to the best aspects that his brother represented initially where he's living this quite glamorous life as a pilot but as you say he's able to sort of take all the bad things away as well and uh, it's yeah quite a sunny idyllic ending really i think which i guess we could relate possibly to the fact that i think in this period films were expected to be quite optimistic but uh, i do like the ending i do think there is something winning about the way everything is resolved so nicely The way you see the character change as well, because he comes back much more confident. And so even though he's now not two different people, he's two the same people, when you see them together, you can tell them apart because he's changed. He's like had this experience and he's changed. He's much more confident. He it feels like he has a sense of purpose, I guess, and that's reflected in the body language and the way he deals with things, and he's come back a completely changed person. And, and this is a lovely little touch where he steals his own car. <laughs> <laughs> what I love too is it's almost like uh, obeying the sort of Chekhov uh, principle about the shotgun, isn't it? In every single element that you see the first time around plays a part again. So, for instance, the uh, the car boot that keeps coming up later appears uh, to reveal the body of Bauer when Bauer is killed. And um, for, again, with the, uh, the metal container for the, the codes, which is used uh, when uh, Jan gets shot and he's able to kind of, he's, he, he's saved basically by having that uh, in his coat pocket. And uh, that's another of the things I, I love, that every single thing is worked back into the story. So even very small things like the woman with the dog or like the flower seller, I think they're just placed very neatly to basically retain that sense of, oh, yes, it's the same day, it's the same order of events. I think there's so much layering going on there. Well, I've seen certain criticism that have said, oh, you know, parts of it don't really make sense and blah, blah, blah. But when you start to watch the film repeatedly, obviously for something like a commentary, and you start to strip it back, you can see how tightly plotted it is and how, in fact, like you say, everything is there to make sense. And they're juggling, you know, all these different dimensions and tie it together with these little things, I think is remarkable. Yeah, no, this works like a like a uh, fine timepiece, the way that everything goes together. I love this, how they have their plans all there, and then Bauer ends yeah. up getting killed by the truck. <laughs> Just immediately, things are set wrong. Yeah. 
he's now become the hero in the story rather than the this passive sort of almost like a it's but the thing that always amazes me is when you first see him it's like this this loser this unconfident character who seems like a like he's clumsy like he scolds himself and you wonder how he manages to fly, fly that ship and then he casually reveals you know i think fairly recently oh i designed it It's just another thing that that sort of brings in this logic to it. Because you think, how is this idiot flying this this time-travelling device? And then it turns out that he's actually the one who designed it in the first place, which is a lovely little touch. I think he just wasn't making the best of himself, was he, before, I think... Uh... And yeah, as you say, it's this sort of uh, clumsiness, isn't it, as well, and how that basically sort of kicks the plot into action where it's that initial phone call to Eva and that whole sort of mistaken identity thing just kind of happens in this very offhand way because he doesn't want to upset her. And then the next thing is the doctor is writing out the obituary. And so basically Jan is kind of put into this role as his brother, really without kind of consciously at first intending that. And so, yes, it's that kind of, uh, yeah, that kind of uh, slightly sort of nebbishy character, isn't it, who who sort of sets everything in motion. And as you say, by the end, he's become this much more confident figure. I mean, I prefer, I have to say, I prefer this to to the original story because the original story is, like, often when you look at Eastern European sci-fi, I mean, even just things that have been covered on the projection booth, for example, like on the Silver Globe or late August at the Hotel Ozone, they can be very dystopian these huge sort of existential dramas about the meaning of life and very depressing because of that. This seems like the... I'm not saying I don't love those films, because I do, but this almost seems like the antidote to those films. It's like the complete opposite. Yeah, I think one thing we've not mentioned too, and I think which is crucial to the sort of exhilarating enjoyment that I get from it is the music, which I think is wonderful. And especially the space travel theme. I think that's such a sort of a winning, almost sort of kitschy, but I think sort of knowingly kitschy piece of music. But it just really makes me happy every time I hear that. And then you also have those weird sort of funk pieces too, don't you? Which I think don't at first seem to belong to it. But uh, watching it again, I realised that I think they do make more sense because I think at times this is almost like a, a crime thriller too. So I think it does give it that, I think that, that soundtrack does give it that nice kind of suggestion of, of a like as though you're watching a crime movie. Yeah, I mean, we've seen in so many films noir where a character will assume the identity of another character be it his brother or be it somebody who comes to town and they don't know it's him i'm thinking of like nicholas cage in red rock west or willem dafoe in white sands where oh there's this character coming to town and maybe they look like somebody they know or maybe we just assume they're somebody and then they live out this the rest of the mystery and try to figure out what's going on and this, him being his own twin brother, and then again trying to figure things out, and now he knows what's going on. Uh, it's uh, pretty remarkable. And yeah, it definitely has those shades of a crime film. Just comment on the fact that they have, because given this is 1995, 1996, obviously mobile phones <laughs> have right. been invented. But you see the phone in this sort of again very mundane truck driver and it's just like a normal phone of the day 
none of this t strange technology that we did actually wow well, I wouldn't say it was that great in 1995, 1996, but <laughs> right. yeah, they just... Uh... <laughs> I, I'm thinking of, uh, well, I guess Patrick Bateman's uh, big cell phone that probably would have been in the 80s, but him and Gordon Gecko with those like phone books that they would hold up to their head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the UK, we only had Del Boy and Only Fools and Horses with those big mobile phones with yeah. the aerial that always went wrong. Giant, giant mobile phone. I'm calling you from my car. <laughs> Here it's just like a normal phone in a truck. It's marvellous. I always wonder if the, the name Universum is a reference to Carol Chapek and Rossum's Universal Robots, but uh, I've never been able to get any confirmation of that. It's interesting, too, that... Um, Universum and the whole sort of time travel setup is all based in Prague. And I think that's one of the things that's interesting, I think, about a lot of these crazy comedies in that they're quite self contained, I think, in that everything big seems to be happening or all these inventions are coming from Czechoslovakia. And I know that there's one um, critic, actually a Czech scholar, Petra Hanarkova, who's written about this and she feels that in some ways um, by doing this, by sort of incorporating all these inventions and all these things, making them part of Czech culture or Czech society, it was almost a kind of like a compensatory measure because I guess at this time in the 70s, I mean, Czechoslovakia was pretty isolated in comparison to how it had been in the 60s. So um, I think the fact that, you know, all of these things are happening in Prague, I think we can say is something like that. It is some kind of compensation for the lack of connection that uh, people felt with the rest of the world. Well, it's interesting what they say about the Czech identity, isn't it? As you mentioned earlier, Jonathan, the the way that, you know, when you had narratives that dealt with, World War Two, and obviously it's something that we discussed on Distant Journey, for example, and Transport from Paradise, that when you had these stories about Nazis, the, the Jewish aspect would often be really toned down because it was more about the Czech identity, the idea of this Czechoslovak citizen as part of a whole unit and so you'd have and there are no jewish characters in this at all it's all about you know this czech technology center and this hero designer guy and and the jewish aspect is completely just not even there it doesn't exist at all yes and i think that would have been pretty deliberate i think i think had they tried to do something different it probably yeah probably would have had some questions asked about it i think um, as far as i know um the figure of ludwig toman who was really the uh, officially known as the official uh, the central dramaturge so he was basically like the the principal figure at barandoff in the 70s he was the guy who basically kind of like read all the scripts and basically gave his okay or gave his criticisms to everything that uh, was being made. As far as I know, it was pretty anti-Semitic. And I believe there's a, a story about Yorai Hertz that uh, Ludwig Thoman used to refer to him as uh, my Jew or my little Jew. And so I, I think that the fact that I think like in, in a film like this, that there are no Jewish characters, I'm sure was something that was not accidental, sadly. I know Hertz really suffered, not to totally get off the, the point or go on to a tangent, but did really suffer as an outsider for but not only being Jewish, but Slovakian as well, was always on the outskirts. His, his adaptation of Nes Vadba's Ferrat Vampire is fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. And I'm glad that one has recently had more reach over here in the West because it had a like a, a restoration. So more people have seen it because it's possibly the, the nearest you get to a conventional Czech horror film. Only a few years after this as well. 
And I think there's sort of reading uh, the author's stories. They're, they're, some of them are so fantastic and interesting. It's a shame, really, that not more of them have turned out in, in the film world in adaptations because as we were talking about amongst ourselves earlier as a you know eastern european author he has had a lot of reach in english language domains which is rare yeah i mean what what's really interesting in relation i think to horror also like in general is that um I believe in the 70s, um, I guess, like, one of the things that people know about, like, Czech cinema or Czech culture in the 70s was that it, it became very orthodox again. It returned to a kind of like a hardline policy. And so, you know, you were not seeing the kind of films that you'd seen in the 60s. But one of the other things I think about the 70s was that there was also an interest uh, officially in uh trying to create genre cinema and trying to create a wider range of genre films. And um, I believe there were a few more experiments with um, horror projects. Um, there was a really fascinating one, which only really got, I think, to script stage that would have been a kind of a zombie film set during the Nazi occupation. And um, unfortunately, I think these kinds of projects, they always sort of hit against the... Uh, the limitations, I think, of the, you know, the sort of ideological mentality at the time in that they were too fantastical or they were too dark. And it's really interesting to think, you know, what it would have been like had some of these films been made. I mean, I think I think the fact that we do have things like Hertz's films, like his fairy tale films, and yeah, like the ferret vampire, I think I think that's pretty remarkable that those did get to be made, even if they were not always quite as he wanted them to be. And I think a film like this too, I think the fact that a film like this could have been made with all these bizarre ideas and these kind of farcical elements, I mean, and, and um, you know, the use of the sort of the Nazi story, I think it still is something quite remarkable, given that uh, this was quite a repressive time, I think, in, in Czechoslovakia. Well, yeah, it's really, but the, the comedy in it is really dark. And we're about to see the whole family perish by... This is probably one of my favorite things. the side of a things. building, which is wonderful. <laughs> and again, this this whole idea about this family of acrobats or circus performers, it's just, again, so crazy. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Why would you put a trampoline best... <laughs> on a roof? <laughs> like, it's don't... one of the best things <laughs> Couldn't about see that coming. <laughs> And it's the, the reaction here, isn't it, of Jan as well? Nothing so terrible. It's just like, oh, okay, I'm just going to make it okay. It's all right. <laughs> uh -huh. Don't worry about it. I have access to a time machine. It's funny, when you read Western reviews of this, or the few that there are, the, the main point of reference, I guess, for Westerners is Back to the Future, and which was several years after this and obviously a very different film but it it tends to get seen you know in mainstream film criticism as you know a bit of an innovator the way that it played with time travel and this idea that if you go back and change something then that has a impact on the future and so you have to keep meddling and you have to keep going back and obviously back to the future does that over three films this this messing with history in the past uh, but when you think this film was doing that years before not on such a grand scale obviously uh, but still remains largely in the shadows of that mainstream film criticism I think just because it hasn't been seen uh, outside of that weird BBC2 showing that seem to impact on a lot of people's lives if you read the forums, well, rightfully so. But, yeah, the innovation here is incredible. And I think that's one of the things that I love so much about Czechoslovak fantasy film is that, you know, we have our Western traditions of fantasy, and I love them. 
but a lot of them are quite formal. Whereas when you get to things like Czechoslovak and Polish and even Soviet era Russia, you have this big mixing pot of very surreal ideas. There's often sort of into subterfuge, uh, political satire snuck in and, you know, all this just, to us, it's, it's not conventional. And I think that's one of the things that always attracted me to the, the Czechoslovak cinema. And why I love this period, people always think the new wave and then bang, Prague Spring comes down 68, 69, it's all over. But to me, one of the most interesting periods of Czech cinema is that first decade, that 70s, where you have a lot... It's almost like when you look at Hollywood, when the Hayes Code first comes in. People think, you know, 34, it's the end of pre-code and everything stops. But it doesn't, because what you see in the next decade or so is this experimentation of what can we get through you know, what can we get away with? And so the language becomes more coded. And you definitely, I know me and Mike have talked about that in the noir with double indemnity. Language becomes more coded. And so this 70s period in Czech film where you have people like Yuri Hertz, for example, making what were pitched to Barandoff as very conventional children's fairy tales actually makes these with the Beauty and the Beast and the Ninth Heart, these, like, horrific, like, horror films, in a way, and manages to sneak them through. The stuff that's coming out through comedy, and things like I Killed Einstein, Gentleman, for example, fantastic. It's just so completely out there. And I think this is one of the best examples of that. Yes, there's a very interesting uh, comment by um, another um, Czech scholar, Petr Stepanik, about how comedy functioned often as like an alibi for genre filmmaking. So I think, as you say, I think comedy was a great way often to smuggle certain things in. So, And I think it's interesting that a lot of the crazy comedies, I mean, they are sort of spoofs or they're spins on various western genres so whether it's sci-fi or whether it's horror or whether it's kind of comic book fantasy and uh, i mean as i remember what Pe- what Stepanik says is that basically what the filmmakers were doing is they were kind of pr- making genre films for audiences who wanted to see genre films because i mean they were not getting a lot of these films from the west at the time so you know they were making those kind of films that viewers could enjoy with you know the sort of typical sort of thrills and spills of a sci-fi or a western or a horror film but by making it as a comedy you could turn around and say well actually this is a, a parody that i'm actually attacking western genre cinema i'm attacking western conventions and i think there was always that skillful sort of double game going on where on the one hand you know you were making like a real sci-fi film or a real horror film but you were also sort of giving yourself that cover that you could turn around and say well actually it's a parody it's not meant to be serious right or the whole we're attacking nazis we're not attacking communists i mean people always think of horror as like the most subversive genre but to me it's always comedy especially when you see comedy that's been made under some form of oppression. So you get that in the Hayes Code, just after the Hayes Code comes in in Hollywood, you get the screwball comedy, which is all about aggressive sex, you know, uh, but it's, again, layered in this very coded language that's not obvious. You saw filmmakers like Billy Wilder, for example, thrive in that era, and I think you see a very similar thing in Czechoslovak film where some of those filmmakers who who weren't banished and managed to survive the Prague Spring and come out of on the other side. People like Hertz, for example, because we've been discussing him, even though he always felt very compromised in that period, he still had a certain freedom in using fantasy 
And those Lipsky comedy films as well are incredible. They're all bonkers, absolutely bonkers. And I, I think what's interesting here in relation to the politics around the main characters is that, I mean, I think you can take it in different ways because I think probably if we're thinking this as I think if we're thinking of this as a reflection of, you know, the official line, the official politics, I mean, you could say that Jan is sort of more of the sort of typical good communist man in that he is, you know, very upstanding and uh, he kind of like informs at one point on people, on the fascists at the end. And so you could say, well, there is a sort of ideological dimension to that. On the other hand, I mean, the figure of Carol, you could say he's much more this sort of Western, sort of James Bond type figure in a sense, and that he's the more glamorous, the more appealing character. And really just by taking away that kind of fascist dimension at the end, you could say that there is a sort of an affirmation of that kind of figure, which is a much more Western, sort of glamorous type of protagonist that you wouldn't really have seen in many other uh, Czech films at the time. So I think you can take that characterization in different ways, really. I'm saying how different Hollywood this is, but the one film that this does actually remind me of is The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, Norman Jewison's sort of satire from 1966, which was seen as a, a, like a fairly farcical Cold War comedy, very American but at the same time, Jewison said he actually was dead serious about some of the themes in it, and it was a, that film was received in Moscow. They absolutely loved it, you know, because he in that you have like a Soviet submarine, and it turns up on I think it's Cape Cod. It turns up at Cape Cod, uh, but the. Russians in that are, are more complex than these sort of caricatures that you get. So it does, I'm not saying this was influenced by it, but it does have a similar vibe in that respect, in that, you know, with that, Jewison was thinking of terms of, you know, and this is like dead right in the Cold War as well, you know, uh, the idea of America and Russia coming together and working together on some level. So you do have this this strange sort of international, like Jonathan touched on earlier, this international vision, you know, of this peaceful world where American tourists can just nip to Prague and time travel off to see Egypt or whatever. He's going to get the triple now. He's going to... <laughs> I love the way he just unscrupulously just dumps his brother like there's no love loss there at all is there dumps him off in the bath but then accidentally dissolves him and then he's just kind of like oh okay that's cleared that mess up <laughs> no emotion whatsoever for his brother which is fantastic yeah, Kat, you mentioned Back to the Future earlier, and that just got me thinking about time travel and time travel comedies. And we've had those, you know, Sleeper was, what, 73? And we've had other time travel comedies where people will come from the past into the future, a uh, man from another century. Um, I think Sex Mission from the Polish Sex film Mission was another one. Sex well, yeah. But as far as this, like, cause and effect time travel it's it, now it feels like after well i don't know if if groundhog day would count as something like that um but it, it feels much more common now than definitely in 1977 it's interesting you brought out sleeper actually because i wrote an essay on that once and how that film in particular and like woody allen's other comedy well i know he was just sort of establishing himself with Sleeper because it was, what, 71? So he hadn't really got to his sort of New York pace by by that point, so he's experimenting with a few things. Does feel very Eastern European because it is like a futuristic farce. Guy falls asleep, wakes up in this strange future, and it 
that film doesn't feel to me like a like an American comedy. It feels very much like the sort of Eastern European comedies. Woody, Woody Allen is apparently very popular among Czech viewers, so <laughs> I think that might... I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if yeah. that's still true, but yes, at least... <laughs> And Sleeper is totally in that same sort of the Oldrich uh, Leapski school of comedy farce. Yes, I think also there's that kind of silent film element, isn't there, to uh, Sleeper? And I think that is a kind of cinema that does tend to recur as a point of reference, I think, in a lot of the Czech crazy comedies. Um, yeah. I mean, we're saying, oh, yeah, you know, they're totally in their own realm, but they obviously the physical... Mike mentioned Buster Keaton earlier, and a lot of the comedy is from that very sort of golden age of of silent comedy, very physical comedy. Mm. It's very explicit, isn't it, in something like Lemonade Joe, for instance, or in Happy End. I mean, those are even visually kind of styled on that period. Which was totally out of vogue everywhere else in... You know, by the 60s and 70s, it tends to be more cerebral. And even Woody Allen himself gets into this more cerebral sort of comedy. So, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I just find them absolutely brilliant. And I hope this new restoration will bring more of a fascination for these comics because I, I think that they're, they're just so underseen in the west although that is starting to slowly change it tends to be you know the czech new wave that that people gravitate to because i guess because contextually it's seen as quote unquote more important i didn't want to mention actually a bit of a sad note but we didn't mention it Susanna on drauchova who plays eva we just saw waving the fiance was actually she was the lead actor Peter Koska's wife and this was her last film role because she died of leukemia the year after this she's really sad so they were married well and meanwhile Peter Koska is still acting I believe he had a film that came out in 2019 